I want to bring to you to start out this afternoon some quotations from the book Adventist Apocalypse, page 211. <clears throat> the work of Satan and his evil angels in the last days to control minds. <clears throat> in the future, great watchfulness will be needed. There is to be among the people of God no spiritual stupidity. Evil angels are actively engaged in seeking to control the minds of human beings. Men are binding up in bundles, ready to be consumed by the fires of the last days. Those who discard Christ and his righteousness will accept the sophistry that is flooding the world. Christians are to be sober and vigilant, steadfastly resisting their adversary, the devil, who is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And I want to just focus in on uh, verse 12 and following. <clears throat> and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is... Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Here is the passage dealing with the New World Order. And Ellen White, commenting on it, pens these words. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, <clears throat> and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, there will be united in opposition to God's people all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the great point at issue, for in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of the heavens and the earth. This afternoon, I would like to bring to you some of the documentation that has come out regarding the foundations of the New World Order. And I want to take you through some of the uh, material that is available on this. First of all, of course, we have the book by Malachi Martin, The Keys of This Blood, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for Control of the New World Order. This book sent uh, shockwaves through the world when it was uh, published, and it contains a wealth of information regarding particularly the role of John Paul II and the behind-the-scenes maneuverings, the way the papacy looks at the various aspects of the New World Order, the, look, the way the papacy looks at the various religions and political blocks and entities and how it conceives of the New World Order taking place. This book is a very uh, wealthy source of information. Now, at the turn of the century, <clears throat> we have a very interesting development that took place in England. At Oxford University, a new professor arrived whose name was John Ruskin. He came in 1870, just note the time frame, 1870, to Oxford like an earthquake. He was a man who had gotten much of his ideas, indeed perhaps most of his ideas and inspiration, 
directly from the source book of all dictatorships, Plato's Republic. And I have a copy of Plato's Republic here. <clears throat> Plato's Republic is a very pivotal work because of the impact that it had on the Roman Catholic Church. Augustine read Plato, and you can read in Augustine's City of God his reference again and again to Plato. Greek philosophy was foundational for Roman Catholic theology. And if you would like to turn with me over to Revelation 13, you can see how that is described by the Word of God. Revelation 13, verse 1 and following. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now the book of Revelation rests upon all the rest of the Bible. All the books of the Bible meet and have their end in the book of Revelation, the spirit of prophecy tells us. And here we can easily recognize the various beasts of Daniel 7. The leopard was Greece. The bear was Medo-Persia. And the lion was Babylon. The body of this beast was like unto a leopard, which m describes the large feature that Greek philosophy played in the development of Roman Catholicism, which is the first beast, which ultimately note at the end of Revelation 13, the image of the beast, which is formed as an image or a replica of the first beast, the papacy, and the image of the beast is also an image to the beast, and all the world is forced to worship this image or replica of the beast. <clears throat> so John Ruskin drew his ideas largely from Plato's Republic. He read Plato almost every day, and Marx, Engels, Prudhan and St. Simon drank from the same fountain. So therefore, there is an amazing parallel between the writings of Ruskin, Marx, and other disciples of Plato. It's interesting to realize that communism rested much of its concepts upon Platonic philosophy, particularly Plato's Republic. Plato wanted a ruling class with a powerful army to keep it in power, and a society completely subordinate to the monolithic authority of the rulers. He also advocated using whatever force was necessary for the wiping out of all existing government and social structure so the new rulers could begin with a clean canvas on which to develop the portrait of their new great society. Now, sitting in Ruskin's class was a man who would have great power in the world. His name was Cecil Rhodes. I spent some time teaching in Rhodesia at Seleucy College, and that land of South Africa was the land where this student of Ruskin, Cecil Rhodes, would one day go and become enormously wealthy and eventually have a nation named after him, Rhodesia, which today has become Zimbabwe. The upper dimensions of Plato's ideal society included the elimination of marriage in the family so that all the women would belong to all the men and all the men would belong to all the women. This was tried, as we mentioned uh, uh, two days ago, I believe it was, in communist Russia, in the Soviet Union, and they found that it was destroying the whole fabric of society, so they reversed themselves on that point. Children resulting from these promiscuous unions would be taken over by the government as soon as they were weaned and raised anonymously by the government as soon as... the uh, and raised anonymously by the state. And what is interesting to notice in our society is the growing interest of the government in children and in daycare and moving ever farther back toward babyhood in its molding power over the next generation. Plato wanted women to be required to be equal with men, and we have the feminist movement today. 
to fight wars with the men and perform labor like men. There was to be selective breeding of men and women under control of the government and children considered inferior or crippled were to be destroyed. That, of course, happened in Nazi Germany, as we noted before. There was to be a three-level structure of society into fixed classes. <clears throat> the ruling class, the military class, and the worker class. Plato said the people would be induced to believe a government indoctrinated falsehood. And uh, Plato reserved the full blessings of communism for his ruling class. It would be there that he felt private property could be eliminated. Family relations communalized and intellectual energy devoted to determining what was good for the masses in the lower classes. Cecil Rhodes was sitting in the classes and he grasped this vision of John Ruskin. It had a sensational impact on the students. His, uh, Ruskin's inaugural lecture was copied out in longhand by Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. And Rhodes would eventually, eventually feverishly exploit the diamond fields and the gold fields of South Africa, would rise to be the prime minister of the Cape Colony. He would contribute money to political parties. He would control parliamentary seats both in England and South Africa. And he would seek to win a strip of British territory across Africa from the Cape of Good Hope to Egypt and join these two extremes together with a telegraph line and ultimately with a Cape to Cairo railway. Rhodes, at the height of his personal income, had a million pounds sterling a year coming into his financial resources, which was then about five million dollars, which was spent freely on his mysterious purposes. And he was almost always overdrawn on his account. This money was being funneled into something very significant. Rhodes had a long-range plan to federate the world, to bring the whole world together under the control of the English-speaking peoples. For this purpose, Rhodes left part of his great fortune to found the Rhodes Scholarships at Oxford in order to spread the English ruling class tradition throughout the English-speaking world as Ruskin had wanted. There were others that joined Rhodes, Arnold Toynbee, Alfred Milner, and others. Britishers primarily. And what Rhodes did was to establish a secret organization, a secret society, which would perpetuate his dream of federating the world, of bringing the world together as one. He had seven wills, and he in his wills laid out the plan for a secret society to be established exactly on the pattern of the Jesuits. They were to take the constitutions of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit constitutions, and use that as the constitution for their order, and they would merely strike out where it said Roman Catholic Church and put in the British Empire. It was quite a plan, and this secret society worked then to gain control of Oxford, and Cecil Rhodes dreamed of being the Caesar and the Loyola of this dynasty that he would establish. Well, this secret society went on to uh, be known as the Round Table Group, the Milner Group, and other names in England. And they spawned other front organizations around the world. In America, they spawned the Council on Foreign Relations. And this Council on Foreign Relations is, as you know, a very powerful organization from which many of our, or most of our most recent presidents have been drawn. Our media, our establishment media, is uh, largely dominated by this organization. It works in collusion with the Trilateral Commission, which has as its goal the bringing together, the interlinking of the economies of the world, particularly the economies of Europe, America, and Japan. 
because these economies generate most of the, or much, not most, but much of the world's uh, output. I have here a book, Transition to a Global Society, which is uh, a, a book that is based on the first international dialogue on the transition to a global society, hosted by the Landeg Academy in Switzerland, exploring the various issues involved in uniting the world in the public and private sectors in the fields of science and technology, culture, ethics, and religion. A very, very interesting subject. Well, this organization that was generated in the thinking of Ruskin and his teaching and accepted by Cecil Rhodes of a federation, a world federation based on the principles of Plato's Republic, went on to exert enormous influence. Now, I don't have Carol Quigley's book here, uh, Tragedy and Hope. It's a big, thick book, and those of you who have seen some of the last Jesuit Agenda videos have uh, seen it there. In that book, he tells of how he had access to the secret records of this society for two years, and he had been studying the society for 20 years, and he was in favor of it. And Carol Quigley is the mentor of Bill Clinton. Carol Quigley was a professor at Georgetown University. He also wrote this book, The Anglo-American Establishment, which is an amazingly documented and detailed description of the activities of this Milner Group, Round Table Group, and its work in the 20th century. Reading from the uh, first page in this book, a kind of a preliminary page before the preface, it says, on rare occasions a book is published which must forever alter the way in which we view the world around us. Within a short time, it becomes difficult to understand how we could have functioned without the knowledge gained from it. The Anglo-American establishment is such a book. In it, Professor Carol Quigley presents crucial keys without which 20th century political, economic, and military events can never be fully understood. The reader will see that this applies to events past, present, and future. While the notion of conspiratorial influence on world events has gained credence with both extremities of the American political spectrum and to a degree with the general public, the more academically oriented person has tended to downplay such interest, influence. And I saw this when I was in college. It was scoffed at that there would be any conspiracy. And yet Ellen White tells us in the great controversy in the chapter Liberty of Conscience Threatened that there is a grand conspiracy with designs upon this world, and that is the conspiracy of Romanism. She says the Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. Let me ask you this. Why would Cecil Rhodes want to be known as the Loyola of this dynasty? Did he know anything about Roman Catholicism? Why would he use the constitutions of the Society of Jesus as the basis, as the constitution for this top secret society with its inner circles of those who are in the ultimate no and its outer circles of those who are generating influence for the organization? The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. That's what Ellen White said in Great Controversy in the chapter, Liberty of Conscience Threatened. So that's, that page is 565, 566, and she tells us this, that the people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. The attempt to arouse the people to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty are being vigorously opposed by the Religious Liberty Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the General Conference. They are turning our names over 
to the Archdiocese of Denver. Very, very interesting developments. But it all tells us a bit about how this Anglo-American establishment was to work. It was to gain control of the propaganda medium of the world. It was to gain control of the information producing elements, the journalists, the news media. Incidentally, when we talk about that, we must realize that the most potent, perhaps the most potent order today of the Roman Catholic Church, Opus Dei, controls hundreds of newspapers, TV stations, and radio stations. They are to a large degree in control of the media of the world. They are patterned along the same lines as the Jesuit order. They are only a, an order only about 70 years old. But there are those many in the Roman Catholic Church that are afraid of this order, Opus Dei. It is so secretive, it is so powerful. But the plan was to gain control of education, to gain control of the media, to gain control of the way people think, and to alter their thinking process. I remember when I was in college, historians, uh, history majors scoffed at the idea of conspiracy, but Ellen White had written that there was a grand conspiracy. And now in books that are so unbelievably heavily documented, you have to see this to believe it. Names, dates, the people on this commission and that commission, it's all been laid out by none other than Bill Clinton's mentor from the Jesuit, the top Jesuit university in America, Georgetown University, located a mile from the White House, where Al Gore and Bill Clinton go to deliver some of their most significant speeches. If you recall, Bill Clinton went over to Oxford with, an, with a Rhodes Scholarship. That was part of Rhodes's plan, to get the intellectuals, to get the most promising young people into the educational process so they could be educated for his plan for World Federation. And so he set up the scholarships, the Rhodes Scholarships, in one of his wills, I believe it was the fifth will, and Bill Clinton went over to avail himself of this. Being a student at Georgetown University, he went over to uh, be a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And while he was there, he met a professor from Georgetown University named McSorley, a Jesuit, who was traveling all over the world, and he tells his account of doing it. In 1979, he wrote uh, his book, on his, or rather, in 1969, he traveled. I forget the publication date. I didn't bring the book with me. Peace Eyes is the title of his book, and it tells of how he was going around the world fostering the hippie-type anti-war movement. Well, Bill Clinton was heavily involved in all of this, and he met McSorley in Norway, and they traveled a bit together there, and then McSorley came over to England, and offered a prayer at one of uh, Bill Clinton's anti-war rallies there. And uh, Bill Clinton went on to ultimately be the governor of Arkansas, at which time he went over to Italy to visit communist communes, to see how they function, and to import the concepts back here into America. While he was governor of Arkansas, he set up the governor's school. The governor's school is a school that is dedicated to taking the gifted and talented, that's the term, gifted and talented young people of America and training them in New Age concepts, presuppositions, and ways of thinking. We found out that the governor's school type of school is now located in virtually every state of the Union. The New Age movement has its eye on the next generation, and that's something that we must never forget. I want to tell you about one attempt to establish a New World Order, just briefly here, and uh, 
I have here the externalization of the hierarchy by Alice Bailey, who was the uh, New Age high priestess. And she speaks very highly in here of Hitler and how he carried the German people on his shoulders. Spoke highly of, uh, he says, she says, Hitler lifted a distressed people upon his shoulders. Lenin, the idealist, Stalin and Franco are all expressions of the Shambhala force and of certain little understood energies. These have wrought significant changes in their day and generation and altered the face of Europe, incidentally affecting Asia and conditioning attitudes and policies in America. Her husband wrote that, that uh, on the Rhine River, a disciple that is of the occult sought to establish a new world order. And I want to bring to you what Adolf Hitler said about this matter of educating the children. Here's what he said, quote, your child belongs to us already. This new Reich will give its youth to no one, but will itself take youth and give to youth its own education and its own upbringing. Hitler had his eye on the youth. And while the parents did not understand what was going on in the schools, he was training a new generation in the occult, the very thing that the governor's schools are doing here in America. In Maria Trapp's book, The Story of the Trapp Family Singers, one reads, quote, this morning we were told by the Nazis at the school assembly that our parents are nice, old-fashioned people who don't understand the new party. We should leave them alone and not bother. We are the hope of the nation, the hope of the world. We should never mention at home what we learn at school now. And the gifted and talented young people who go to the governor's school are discouraged from making any phone calls home, are discouraged from writing home. They are basically in a closed environment. And here is what the uh, columnist Thomas Sowell wrote in the Daily Oklahoman, December 9, 1992. Both God and America come under attack in an Arkansas summer school program established by Bill Clinton and called the Arkansas Governor's School. Among a steady diet of hard left views said to high schoolers in this program is a feminist attack on the idea of a male God and male savior and an attack on Christianity by the 19th century writer Ludwig Feuerbach, who inspired Karl Marx's view on the subject. No counter views were considered necessary. Poverty in America is depicted as something deliberately created by the establishment. Military defense is ridiculed. Homosexuality and radical feminism are in. Traditional values are out. Clinton did not merely inaugurate this summer program. He appoints the people in charge of it. He has given its opening address every summer, and Hillary Clinton has lectured there. This is the new breed of new age leader that is being educated all across our country. Someone just handed me, uh, while I was here, a picture of a school in San Francisco where a lesbian couple was invited in and the children were taught about the lesbian family. This type of thing is going on throughout America. We know that the headlines have been occupied with the situation with our military. The military establishment has been greatly exercised about it. But the New Age conditioning process keeps pushing on. It seeks to always be pushing on, and if it can't get quite fully what it's after, it's content to go a step in that direction and let the conditioning process carry on there and then a step further. And this has its implications for us. This technique has its implications for us with reference to the structure of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. People have noted that in the adult tent, at the camp meetings, oftentimes a fairly conservative speaker is holding forth. And the attacks against the independents may not be all that significant, although a few things here and there. But when they go over to the youth department, the walls of the building are shaking, the hands are up over the head, all kinds of things are going on. 
the youth, the capture of the youth. It's happening in our church schools where the children are sometimes being asked to lie down on the floor and do physical mantras, squeezing their biceps muscles rhythmically. The implications of this are enormous because what happens is that we are having a whole generation of young people that are coming into being with a completely different set of presuppositions than what America was founded on. We have people now, children coming along who are being educated to new age concepts regarding pantheism. Pantheism is the idea of God being in everything. This is fundamental to the new age. A completely different starting point of viewing life than having a personal, infinite creator God who is holy and separate from creation. This all affects how a person views the universe. It affects what the nature of man is. It affects the basis for morality and brings in moral relativism, the idea that there are no absolutes instead of the Ten Commandments and the stories of the Bible. In his best-selling book, The Closing of the American Mind, Professor Alan Bloom from the University of Chicago has demonstrated in a book that has shocked America what has happened to the young people of America. The very first page of the introduction. There is one thing that a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. If this belief is put to the test, one can count on the student's reaction. They will be uncomprehending. They are unified only in their relativism and in their allegiance to equality. And the two are related in a moral intention. The relativity of truth is not a theoretical insight, but a moral postulate, the condition of a free society, or so they see it. In actuality, this is exactly what happened in Germany. And he goes on in his book to point out how the professors that fled from Hitler from the universities in Germany came over here and introduced the very ideas of moral relativism that they had been teaching over in Germany, which had produced Nazism, which had ultimately driven them out of Germany. Hegel is largely responsible for this, and Hegel's idea was the idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is something that the New Agers understand very well, how to accomplish change using thesis, antithesis, synthesis. If you have a thesis, if you have a situation which exists in a country that you want to change, you drive that country hard to the opposite position. And then when there's a reaction that sets into that, you synthesize the two positions into the ultimate position that you want. And uh, Jesuit professor named, uh, see if I can remember his name, I didn't bring his book, Murray, if I recall correctly. Murray wrote a book on the United States Constitution, and uh, We Hold These Truths was the title of it. In this book, he tells of how America started out as a Protestant nation, believing in the Word of God, believing that if the Bible said it, you believed it, you acted on it, no questions asked, you had self-sacrificing love for your neighbor, you operated on moral absolutes, and you had a clear ethical and moral perception of life and what God was asking of you. He goes on to tell of what has happened in America, how that has completely been divested from public life, from the public sector, and how in its place, situationalism or relativism has taken hold. And that's the idea that all truth is relative. Even in our academies, this has happened. I spoke to a friend of mine who I'd gone to academy with, who was a, now a men's dean. And I said to him, how do the young people differ today in the dorm than when we were students? And he said, today, every one of them in the dorm believes that truth is relative that what's okay for me may not be okay for you, 
and what's okay for you may not be okay for me. Truth is relative. And Murray goes on to tell how ultimately America will find that relativism will not work, and then they will be prepared for Roman Catholic natural law, which is something very different than John Locke's concept of natural law. Roman Catholic natural law, the church decides what is right. Religious freedom fits in around what the church decides is right and what the state acts out. It is the revival of the way it was before the Protestant Reformation. A very, very interesting book to study in light of the great controversy. And so the implementing of the very concepts of New Age in America is exactly the same kind of thing as what happened in Germany. Constance Cumbie, in her book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, has a whole chapter in where, she, where she describes the parallels between Nazism and New Age thinking. She has parallel columns. She says the cosmology and cos cosmogony of Nazism and the New Agers are identical. Both Nazism and the New Age movement are programs for expediting the path to transcendental consciousness, for the transformation of the masses through initiation into the mysteries. Occult teachings and pagan practices were injected into the mainstream of a nation during Hitler's reign. I have here a book by Al Gore, Earth in the Balance, and an analysis of certain sections of this book by John Barella, The New Covenant of Bill Clinton and Al Gore, Neo-Pagan Fundamentalism and the New Politics. At the inauguration of, uh, rather at the, uh, I believe it was when he was uh, nominated in his acceptance speech, Bill Clinton announced the New Covenant. And we can see what this New Covenant is in this book. He upholds pantheism. He upholds the idea of Gaia, the ancient earth goddess. On page 260, Al Gore clearly reveals his own understanding concerning goddess worship. He states, the spiritual sense of our place in nature predates Native American cultures. A growing number of anthropologists and archaeomythologists such as Marija uh, Jambutas and Rian Eisler argue that the prevailing ideology of belief in prehistoric Europe and much of the world was based on the worship of a single earth goddess who was assumed to be the fount of all life and who radiated harmony among all living things. The evidence for the existence of this primitive religion comes from the many thousands of artifacts uncovered in ceremonial sites. These sites are so widespread that they seem to confirm the notion that a goddess religion was ubiquitous throughout much of the world until the antecedents of today's religions, most of which still have a distinctly masculine orientation, almost obliterating belief in the goddess. The last vestige of organized goddess worship was eliminated by Christianity as late as the 15th century in Lithuania. Uh, the archaeological scholarship is impressive, and it seems obvious that a better understanding of a religious heritage preceding our own by so many thousands of years could offer us new insights into the nature of human experience. I could go on and on and on with his positions that he takes here. Amazing, amazing that we have now Things have come to the point where our government is now being headed by people who have the same ideology, the same philosophies as were functional in Nazi Germany and as are functional in Freemasonry and as are functional in the ancient pagan religions and in the occult and spiritualism. This is why we are seeing so much talk about meditation, journaling, and the self-help movement in the uh, bookstores. 
Just to give you a few ideas here, Nazism was an offshoot of occultic practices and teachings. The Nazis had a Bureau of the Occult as a part of the German government under Hitler. This was known as the SS Occult Bureau. Another such agency was the Nazi Occult Bureau. Recently, PBS uh, has been airing a series on the occult origins of the uh, Nazi movement. Now, the New Age movement is based on occultic practices and teachings, particularly the writings of Helena Pre Petrovna Blavatsky, especially the Secret Doctrine, and Alice Bailey, the one that I referred to here, who claimed to be receiving telepathic messages from the Tibetan master, Jawal Kool. All forms of occultism and mind expansion are permitted and encouraged within the New Age movement. Nazism taught the doctrine of Arianism and Aryan purity and that the New Age would feature an Aryan mutant master race. The New Age movement teaching stressed the doctrine of Arianism and Aryan purity. See especially Alice Bailey's writings and the writings of David Spangler. The New Agers believe that through meditation and other spiritual disciplines that they have become a new species. Homo noeticus as opposed to Homo sapiens. And that Homo sapiens is a dying species. They teach that the Jews are from a different solar system. That's from Alice Bailey. And that the Orientals and blacks are from a different root race. Occidental races must control the world as they are presently our most evolved root race. Well, we could go on and on. There's page after page here. The Nazis believed in the law of karma and reincarnation. The New Agers believe in the law of karma and reincarnation. Uh, Hitler used mescaline to speed up consciousness expansion. The use of drugs as a catalyst in consciousness expansion has long been a part of the New Age movement. The Nazis thought they had evolved into a new and superior species by means of spiritual disciplines and consciousness evolution. The New Agers think they have evolved into a new and superior species, Homo noeticus as opposed to Homo sapiens, by means of spiritual disciplines and consciousness evolution. Uh, I have here the book, which is one of the most fundamental books on the New Age, The Aquarian Conspiracy, Personal and Social Transformation in Our Time, by Marilyn Ferguson. In this book, she tells how Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit, is the most influential figure in the New Age movement. But she's dealing here with the thinking, the ideological changes that are brought about by the New Age movement, and that the New Age is seeking to instill new values. A political paradigm shift might be said to occur when the new values are assimilated by the dominant society. These values then become social dogma to members of a new generation who marvel that anyone could ever have believed otherwise. We are in that kind of a political paradigm shift right now. And of course, the Fundamentalist Christians in this nation believe that the experience of Waco was a major showcase in point to demonstrate the New Age, New World Order concepts regarding groups that do not belong to the mainstream ecumenical movement. The attempt to change the thinking of society and to bring in the occult has had enormous impact already here in America. In the occult in the Third Reich, one learns that in the 1930s, Hitler said, with the notion of races, National Socialism will use its own revolution for the establishing of a new world order. In occultist Alice Bailey's The Externalization of the Hierarchy, which I have here, one reads that beginning in 1934, there was the organizing of the men and women so they can set the note of world goodwill for the new world order. Group work of a new order with progress defined by service, the work of the brotherhood, the forces of light, and out of the spoilation of all existing culture and civilization, the new world order must be built. Someone just handed me at dinner time today some clippings that just 
just came out that are typical of this. Here is a, an article entitled, entitled Commander Confident Base Left in Good Order. We are adapting to the new world order, he said. There is an increasing requirement for airlift, not only for our own troops, but allied troops as well. And those of you who have followed the news know that we reached a historic precedent in sending in UN troops into Somalia, the first time that UN troops were sent into a nation without the nation requesting it. Set a new tone. And articles are coming out now, written by Jesuits, regarding the new Roman Catholic thinking, which is not new at all, but basically exposing it, that uh, killing may be necessary now for humanitarian projects. Here is an ad from Macy's, dressing for a new world order. Just showing the, the extent to which this thing spreads. Army unveils new doctrine for a new world. The army marches into a new intellectual era this week as it formally abandons its Cold War fighting doctrine and adopts a code that emphasizes quick, quick strike moves to faraway lands. And of course, the pressure is on now for a United Nations military that has more muscle to give the uh, United Nations more clout in enforcing its ideas. The NBC theme this year on television is In the New World, a New Spirit of Excellence. So it is a conditioning process. It is a broadly based conditioning pro pro uh, process, not only in overt occultic things, and in the occultic games, Dungeon and Dragons, where the children learn to cast spells and do all kinds of witchcraft and that, but in the all-pervasive areas of even dress and every aspect, the conditioning process is on for the unification of the world, which we read about in Revelation. Alice Bailey tells us in her externalization of the hierarchy that the conditioning process is to go on in the churches, in the Masonic lodges, and in education. Those are the three great branches. And the conditioning process will utilize the existing structures to, as it gradually changes the thinking, and finally, as the thinking is evolved enough and changed enough, then the old structures give way and new structures come in, and ultimately the hierarchy is externalized when there's enough love and peace, and when separate individualism and individualized worldviews are eliminated and put under the power of death, and the world is unified in love, new age love, which means the elimination of individuality, and which means the collectivization of consciousness and thought. When that finally reaches the final point, then the Christ will appear, surrounded by his angels. And with that, we are recalled to the description in great controversy of how Satan will appear at the end of time as the Antichrist, as the fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens. All of this occultism, all of this spiritualism, and spiritualism is a philosophy as well as supernatural phenomena. Spiritualism is the idea that there is, was no fall, there's no need for the atonement, there is to be all of this sentimental love. Ellen White says that's one of the worst forms of the modern spiritualism. The idea that every mind judges itself and that we have a God within, this is all spiritualism. And this will all bring about an increasing amount of supernatural phenomena in our society in the West. And she writes here, fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle-working demons. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception 
and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. Incidentally, the concept of small groups and small group networking is very fundamental to the Aquarian conspiracy, to the New Age movement. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. We already have rulers who are deeply involved in spiritualism. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belongs to the world's Redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. That's when the hierarchy is externalized. In this book, she even lays out, Alice Bailey lays out, the stages in the externalization, the hastening of the coming one, the, uh, the leaders, the occult secret leaders that carry forward their work among the Red Cross and in the various sectors of humanity. Incidentally, the philosophies that have taken hold in the mind of the man on the street are spiritualistic philosophies. I have Nietzsche's books here. Nietzsche, incidentally, is considered to be the most preeminent philosophical conception in the minds of the people in America today. And Nietzsche wrote this book, Beyond Good and Evil, the idea that we are beyond the categories of good and evil. We merely have to establish our own lifestyle and establish our own values. Here is the will to power. Nietzsche replaced the, the role of God in the life with self. And this is, what, uh, this is what Alan Bloom so carefully documents in his book, In the Closing of the American Mind. It was Nietzsche's concepts that have taken hold on a broad base, spiritualistic concepts. And Hitler had, as one of his favorite authors, Nietzsche, he gave a complete set of Nietzsche's works to Mussolini, complimenting him on one of his military victories. The young people of Germany who had a hippie movement prior to the Nazi takeover, wandering around all over Germany in the Wandervogel, the Birds of Passage movement, would sit around their campfires at night with their musical instruments in the forests and read Nietzsche. The replacement of God in the life with self. And one who was involved in the International Humanist and Ethical Union wrote in the Humanist magazine in September, October 1981, if schools can teach dependence on one's self, they are more revolutionary than any conspiracy to overthrow the government. That was written by H.J. Blackham. That's why we have all of this talk about self-esteem today. It's all through the church growth movement. It is all through the structure of Seventh-day Adventism because of the church growth movement. But Ellen White said that self-esteem is a dangerous weed that has to be uprooted from the life. Self-esteem cannot exist when the cross of Calvary is seen. Self-esteem is one of the most dangerous. And Alan Bloom tells of riding in a taxi cab down in Atlanta. Taxi cab driver had just been released from prison a short time before and was telling him about his experiences in prison about all of the different therapies that he had been through. Depth analysis, transactional analysis, gestalt, and on and on. And finally, he turned to Alan Bloom and he said, as a result of all of it, he said, I found myself, I found my own identity, and I learned to like myself. And Alan Bloom, commenting on that, says, how interesting. He says, a generation before, the man would have said, I found God, and I learned to despise myself as a sinner. And of course, we know that that righteousness which alone will give us entrance into heaven is the righteousness of Christ. But how 
psychology has taken over as the religion of the West. A psychology that is based on the occult principles of Jung, of Freud, and of Carl Rogers, all of whom were involved in the occult. This is a very all-pervasive thing, and as the teachings of spiritualism take hold, Ellen White said, we are going to see these amazing developments. We are going to see the fearful sights of supernatural character in the heavens. And then finally Satan will come as if he were Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. And now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. What happened under the occult and under the philosophies of Nietzsche and Hegel, both of which have taken firm hold in America now, perhaps to a far greater degree than they did in Germany, because there is only a, an estimated, I understand estimated about 8% were actual Nazis in Germany. But what we have now in America is an all-pervasive cloud of the same kind of thinking that has taken hold all through society. And we will see a climax to this that will be far greater than anything that happened in Nazi Germany or that happened in communism under Stalin. Finally, the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation, Revelation 1, 13 to 15, and how shocked I was when I saw the picture of the coming of the, the, coming of the cosmic king on the front of Ministry Magazine in August, I believe it was, of 1990. And it was stated in the description about the picture that it was based on Revelation 1. And I could hardly believe my eyes that they would be so blatant as to have a picture of a New Age Catholic Christ and say that it was based on this passage in Revelation 1, 13 to 15, which describes, according to Great Controversy, the coming of the Antichrist. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. The people who are duped by softness and by melody and by tender tones will fall right into this trap. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is a strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes, from the least to the greatest, give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. The conditioning process is mushrooming, urging on humanity to this climax of deception. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the Scriptures. You notice the people of God have had at each step, they have had to base their life on Scripture. They have had to take a stand on Scripture despite the subtlety of the attacks. His blessing, that is this false Christ's blessing, is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. The Bible makes a distinction between the godly and the ungodly. And those who would blur that distinction with a love that knows nothing about holiness set themselves up for this deception. Furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. 
the Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. This coming, there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. I dare say that a number of years ago there were many people sitting in the pews of Seventh-day Adventist churches who never thought they would be taken in by this thing. But already they are vastly down the path of the conditioning process of preparation for this. We look around us today and we are shocked at those who have departed from the true faith. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. The Bible has to be more of a reality than the things that we see with our eyes. To all, to all, every person in this auditorium and watching and everyone in the world, the testing time will come, the testing of the sifting of temptation. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Have you seen that sifting going on? There is an enormous sifting that is going on right now. Are the people of God so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Is the reality of the word of God a greater reality than the things that you see with your eyes? The person who lays aside his Bible to watch television by the hour, who lays aside his Bible to spend time soaking up the media, the culture, the spiritualistic medium and environment in which he lives, that is coming in like a dark cloud over humanity will not be ready when that hour comes. We have to be spending time with the Word of God. We have to be memorizing it. Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. And that prevention of preparation will be every bit as dangerous to you in the final analysis as the most wicked sin that you could commit because both will be lost. Both will be in the lake of fire. Unless we make the preparation, we will be lost. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. Now is the hour of salvation. Today is the day to be anchored in the Word of God. Today is the day to make the reality of the Word of God a greater reality than the things of sight around us. Today is the day to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Terry, would you like to come up and have the closing prayer? Or am I supposed to have it? Let's kneel for the closing prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, today we have considered some of the materials that are available that shed light on the truth of Revelation 17 regarding the great conspiracy to bring about a new world order. We have looked at only briefly and very lightly at some of the features of this, the capture of the oncoming generation the occult, the spiritualistic philosophies, the machinery in place in education and in the media and in governments, the organizations at work, past trial runs, and yes, indeed, the situation that we are in today in all realms of human life and thought. And today we pray that the Word of God will assert its primacy in our life that we will walk by faith and not by sight, that we will be anchored to thy throne, that the reality of Christ will be a greater reality than the things that we see with our eyes, and that we will be guided by his guidance, his power, his strength, his wisdom, his love, and anchored in the rock of ages, so that when the storm comes that tests every soul to its very foundations, it will be found that we have built on the rock Christ Jesus and that we can stand fast by faith in him and his word. May that be the experience of each one of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.